Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You still hear me okay? I need to adjust anything. You're right. Uh, a water, yes, please, thank you. And a water would be great. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Okay. I'm very excited about the sermon. Too far. Check, check. <clears throat> My check. You all right? Yeah. All right. I'm very excited about the sermon that I've got tonight. Uh, this is, I think this might be one of my favorite sermons that I've ever written, maybe second favorite. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to be reading verses 10 through 20. Check. Mic check one, two. How's that? Is that better? Good. You good? Yeah. All right, perfect. Hallelujah. So, how many of you are familiar with Murphy's Law? What's Murphy's Law? Anything that can go wrong, possible, will go wrong. <laughs> and it will go wrong at the worst possible moment. <laughs> The United States Marine Corps and several other veterans of combat branches created Murphy's Laws of Armed Combat with such gems like friendly fire isn't. The enemy diversion that you've been ignoring will be the main attack. If the enemy is in range, so are you. When you have secured the area, don't forget to tell the enemy. When you are short of everything except the enemy, you are in combat. How many of you know that our Christian life is a war? Every day, every minute, it is a battle. And sometimes it feels like we've been under fire for a long time long time and we're weary and we're fatigued we are in a fight whether we like it or not and if you find yourselves in the middle of a fair fight my brother used to tell me it's your own dang fault we are not called to fight fair God has no intentions on us fighting a fair fight with the devil we're called to have dominion we're called to crush our enemy under our feet like Jesus did so, I'm not here to tell you how to fight fair. Tonight, I'm going to tell you how to win. Ronald Reagan said, diplomacy was the art of saying, nice doggy, nice doggy, while you're getting a stick. God took the time to make sure that we have superior weaponry to our enemy. Let's take a moment to examine that and talk about tilting the fight in our favor. Because I don't think the devil deserves a fair fight. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. 
Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, and keeping with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in the opening of my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Amen. Let's talk about the reality. The reality is that as soon as we begin to do something for God, there's going to be resistance. The minute we stand and say, Jesus, my life is yours, you are going to start experiencing pushback. The scripture begins with the phrase, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Why do we need to be strong? Because it's a fight. Because, like, I remember when we got to China, I found myself really, really struggling. Boredom will kill you. It will murder you dead. Because idle hands are the devil's playground. So I tried to keep myself busy. But I found myself literally pacing the floor of my apartment. like Because there's only so much you can do in a third world country. There's only so much you can do overseas. In a place where you can't outreach. Where you can't just walk out and find somebody and tell them about Jesus. There's only so much you can do. So Sarah said, get a membership at a gym. And I was like, all right. So I went around to a couple of the gyms and I got a membership. I found one that was cheap and had everything I wanted. And I go the first day and man, dude, I killed it. I crushed some stuff the first day. Then I woke up the next day and couldn't move. And I was like, oh, maybe I went too hard. And I live on the 40th floor. And the elevators were frequently broken. So I'm like, oh, walking down 40 flights of stairs. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Every step. Oh, God. After the third flight of stairs, you contemplate, if I just roll down all these stairs, how injured would I be? <laughs> there is always opposition when we begin something that's good. We will always hit that point where we go, dude, why am I doing this? Because there's pushback. Isn't this supposed to be easy? Aren't I supposed to get saved and serve God? And it's supposed to be peaches and rainbows and butterflies and roses spring up where I walk. Little pixies fly around and sprinkle happy dust on me. No, that's not the way it works. Why do we need to be strong? Because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces in the heavenly places. This tells us two things right from the beginning. Number one, it tells us that we are not strong enough to accomplish the task at hand. Be strong how? In the Lord. In the power of whose might? His might. This war that we are fighting cannot be won on our terms. Have you ever noticed that the moment you begin to make a stand for the gospel, all of a sudden, they make rules at your job that say you can't talk about it? They start firing people. Never for being outspoken for like any liberal cause. But the minute you say that something is sin, the moment you begin to bring people to church, your car breaks down. The minute you're like involved in a ministry, your old drug dealer runs into you and goes, hey, why don't we hang out? And that always happens. 
6.45 right before church. This type of resistance will happen more and more frequently depending on the number of people that are counting on you to show up. And here's the trick. You don't even have to know they're counting on you. There are people in this congregation who look at other people in this congregation as an anchor point. People who walk in and go, oh, George is here, everything's okay. Zelda's here, everything's okay. Joe's here, everything's all right. Who walk in struggling, and if you weren't here, they'd go, oh, I knew I couldn't. If he can't make it, I can't make it. She can't make it, I can't make it. The more committed you become to Jesus, the less the devil wants you in the game. The second thing that the scripture tells us is that we definitely have an enemy. Although, it may not be who we initially think it is. Let's talk about knowing our enemy. Secondly. <clears throat> this August... I will have been married to Sarah for 25 years. And in that time, we've had some pretty catastrophic arguments. One of the worst arguments we ever had was a few weeks before our third anniversary over soap. <laughs> soap? I had been working on the car which is a comedy to begin with because I know jack all about engines. So I had been, like, we had this old Subaru GL and the water pump, I had blown the water pump and it was just leaking water out, out the bottom of the engine. And I kept refilling it and trying to drive it, but the temperature just rise because it's just pouring water out. So I finally decide that, okay, it's time to replace the water pump. So I go on to this little import store and I buy the water pump and this is the way I fix cars. I go to the store and I go, I need a water pump. They give me a box. I open the hood of my car. I pull the thing out of the box and I go, what looks like this on this engine? <laughs> and I figure, I can figure it out, right? I mean, I'm, a, I'm a smart guy, man. So I find the thing that looks like this. And I look at the holes in this thing where it's supposed to mount to the engine. And I go, okay, so that must be where the screws are that hold it together. But I had gotten this engine so hot that I had welded the screws to the aluminum head of the engine. So I start to twist on them and literally just pop the heads off every single bolt to hold this water pump on. So now the water pump's not attached and I can't attach a new water pump. So I'm covered in grease and oil and grime. I'm frustrated, I'm angry, I'm not saved. And I walk in to the bathroom, and I am black and grimy from the top of my elbows to the tips of my fingers. And I just walk into the bathroom, I turn on the water, and I grab the bar of soap that's next to the sink. It is a transparent, nicely scented Neutrogena bar of face soap. Now, what do I care about whether or not something is Face soap. This is soap. Soap is soap is soap. And I start to scrub this garbage off of me, and Sarah walks in, and her bar of face soap is now grimy and gray and black. And she loses her crap. In moments like these, it's very easy to begin to assign roles of who, who your enemy is. Because in my mind, I was completely innocent of anything wrong. I was just trying to get cleaned up so that I wouldn't be a filthy mess for her. And in her mind, I was clearly the villain destroying her $9 bar of soap. There are three basic roles in any drama. You have the hero, you have the villain, and you have the victim. 
Those are the three roles that are assigned to everyone in every situation. We look at this situation about the soap. And I started to assign the roles. Who's the victim? Me. Who's the villain? Well, there's only other, one other person in the situation, so clearly Sarah is the villain. So who's the hero? Me. <laughs> and in many situations, we go, who's the victim? Us. Who's the villain? The other person. And who's the hero? Anyone who steps in to defend us. Our friends, our family, our co-workers, our boss, students, neighbors, those people are not the enemy. And it is foolish of us to try to put them in that position. So who is our enemy? Verse 12 says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So that immediately tells us that no matter how bad a situation is, the enemy is not the person we are dealing with. Who do we wrestle against? We wrestle against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers over this present darkness. That's since the beginning of time. Against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Heavenly places means above the sky. It's very clear, according to our scripture, who our real enemy is. Ephesians chapter 2 goes further. And says, you were once dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, we were by nature... Children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. So who is the villain? The villain in every situation is the prince of the power of the air. The devil. Pastor Marty Carnegie preached a brilliant sermon last conference. It's the devil! <laughs> now we have assigned the role of the, vi the villain. Right? Remember, we have three roles to fill. Now we know who's filling the role of the villain. That means we have two other roles. Who is the hero? Ephesians chapter 2 says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated, and, uh, raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. But God, two of the largest worlds in, in the entire Bible, being rich in mercy wants to show us the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us. So the villain is the devil. The hero is God. So who's the victim? Two victims in this situation. We victimize God with our disobedience and our sin. And sin, the devil, through sin, victimizes us. So in every good hero movie of my, my youth, there's always, this is an 80s trope. In fact, now if you see a movie and it's making fun of the 80s, it's going to have this in it because... It's an 80s thing. In every movie of my youth where there is a hero, there is a training montage. The music is playing. And there's Rocky, you know, beating on the side of beef. Running up the stairs. Stopping halfway up the stairs to throw up. The hero suffers a defeat. He vows to come back, vows to redeem himself. He trains and trains and trains and gets better and better and better. And then there's the moment when he receives the jersey that has his name on it or he gets the giant robot or he receives the new cyborg body 
And in all of these films, there's a moment when the hero is suiting up or putting on the outfit or the uniform or the armor. And in the first moment of the film, the hero actually looks heroic. And you go, cool. He's going to kick some butt now. God has a special suit of armor for us because he knows we're going to have to fight to be successful, minus the 80s training montage, minus the eye of the tiger. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 to 18 says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, and we're going to walk through this together, that you may be able to withstand the evil in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. Let's talk about the belt of truth. You know, when I was doing professional security, there's a serious problem with doing executive protection. And that problem is something you might not expect. That problem is using the restroom. When you go to the restroom and you're armed, the minute you unbuckle your belt, your pants hit the floor. Because there's like 40 pounds of weight on you. So a good belt becomes a foundation for your armor, for your weaponry. Everything is anchored to the belt, and the belt distributes all the weight across your hips. Ronald Reagan said of liberals that the problem is not that they do not know anything. The problem is that they know so much that isn't true. This is why the central piece of the Christian armor is truth. Truth is the central foundational anchor point of everything else in our armor. Then we go to the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness, this is the same word that's translated as justification, which means essentially, in a nutshell, just as if I had never sinned. Jesus justifies us. So the breastplate of justification. Now this is to cover our heart. Because the devil will try to twist our heart in two ways. He uses our past, and he uses the people around us. Keeping the truth, remember, we're foundationally truth, that our sin was washed away. We have been justified by Jesus. That will keep us steady when the devil tries to attack us with our past. Do you remember when you... Do you remember when you, do you remember when you, and you can say, that's not me. <clears throat> Those events happened, but they happened because of someone else who was not washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. I am washed in the blood. Okay. Keeping that truth central will keep our heart from becoming discouraged and, and uh, con uh, what's con condemned by the, the facts of our past. It will also keep us steady when the devil tries to warp our hearts about other people. Because I have no right to judge you. I'm no better than you. I'm a sinner like you're a sinner. I'm no worse than you. You're no worse than me. Jesus died for me, so Jesus died for you. So I no longer have the right to look at a person's sin and say, that's gross. That's sick. That's terrible. They're wretched. I'm wretched. I really appreciate what Paul said. Of sinners, I am the chief. I think every one of us can say that. So remember, we have the foundation of truth. The breastplate of justification keeps our heart steady. And it talks about shoes. Preparation provided by the gospel of peace. The gospel 
Jesus, or Paul said to Timothy, be instant, in season and out of season. Be prepared to give an answer about the faith that was given to you. By knowing that Jesus calls all people to repent, he is willing that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It will prepare us for any situation. At any moment, we will be ready to offer a solution to people's sin. By simply knowing the gospel, no matter where we are or who we're talking to, then we go to the shield of faith. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God. The devil will attack your mind with thoughts like, Look, you are obviously not saved. Otherwise, you wouldn't crave these things. And the devil does this, right? The devil will go, Hey, man. Don't you think it'd be really great if you had some booze? And you're like, I don't think I want... I can't believe you're thinking about booze right now. Jeez, man, if you were a Christian, you wouldn't be thinking about booze. Now, if this was a dude, if this was a roommate, you'd be like, bro, you brought it up! I didn't think about it. You walked in here talking about it. But he's not a roommate. We can't see him. We can't punch him. We can't kick him out of our life. He's just sort of there. And these thoughts hit us. The Bible refers to these thoughts as fiery darts. Why? Because they start wildfires in our mind. It just starts to run. And then before long, we're like, dude, why have I been thinking about this all day? Faith is what will extinguish those attacks. We say, no. Because I have faith. I have faith in my salvation. I have faith in the truth. I have faith in the justification. And finally, we talk about the helmet of salvation. Knowing that we have been saved from our sin will prevent us from falling back into it. If you fall off a boat in the middle of the ocean and you almost drown and they drag you out of the water an inch from death, your first thought is, I wonder how close to the edge I can get. If I fall in, will you save me again? Is that, that the way this works? That is not our first thought. The first thought of a rescued person is to be in the middle of the boat as far from the water as they possibly can be. When you're saved from death, you want to get as far away from the danger as possible. You will be assaulted by thoughts promising you how wonderful life would be if you just slipped away. Just think. This is a lot like in the early 80s, the army was having a, a lull in recruitment. So recruiters started promising people some crazy stuff. They'd give you a car if you go and you make it through basic. They'd, do it. And they'd just promise you the world. You know, oh man, basic's so awesome. You stay in condos now. It's so great, you know. You only have like one roommate. Now, of course, none of that was in writing. I have a friend who joined the Air Force two years ago. His recruiter promised him a $20,000 signing bonus. Wow, that's great, man. Yeah, sign me up. But he didn't read the contract, and that $20,000 signing bonus didn't show up anywhere in writing. So he didn't get it. He was promised it, but he didn't get it. The devil does this all the time. Just think. Man, how good it would feel for you or be with that person or to engage in that relationship thoughts of fulfillment thoughts of loneliness thoughts of discontentment thoughts of anger 
thoughts of offense. Everything would be better if you just left. These are assaults from hell about how rewarding sin can be. But the helmet of salvation will help you filter those thoughts and say, wait, hold on. I was saved out of that. I don't need to go dabbling in the ocean again. I almost drowned the first time. Finally, finally we get offensive. All of this is suiting up to protect us from the attack. And then God says, now I'm going to give you the gun. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now when you look at Jesus, who is our ultimate example, Jesus was in the wilderness, and he's the, he's being assaulted. And these are, this is not like, we read it and we kind of go, oh, these are kind of lame temptations. You know, turn these stones to bread. That's kind of lame. But the fact is that Jesus was 100% human. He's 100% God and 100% human. And the part of him that was married to this earth was hungry. He was dying from hunger. Forty days is a long time to not eat. And then he tempts him with his own divinity. You're the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Because you know you can it's not impossible for you. You can do anything. I know who you are. Dude, why are you suffering? Do something about it. It would be exactly the same as if we were fasting for 40 days. 40 days. We're laying on the couch, barely enough strength to get up and walk to the fridge. And all of a sudden somebody goes, Dude, there's steak in the fridge. Just have some steak. It's right here, man. That's within our power to do this. To just get up and walk to the fridge and have something to eat. It would have been that simple for Jesus to make those stones bread. But Jesus responds with, it is written. He doesn't respond with, no, I can't do that because it wouldn't, it would violate the will of God. No, he responds with the word of God. It is written. Not, it's my opinion. Not, I feel. It is written. He takes him to the pinnacle of the temple. Throw yourself down. I know that you have a destiny. You know that you have a destiny. God knows you have a destiny. And God's not going to let that destiny end prematurely. It is written. He takes him to the pinnacle of a high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the earth. I'll give it all to you if you bow down and worship me. It is written. Our only weapon is it is written. This is what the Jesus says, or Luke says about the devil after that moment. In Luke chapter 4, verse 13, he says, And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. The enemy wasn't done. It's a strategic retreat. The devil is waiting for an opportune moment to attack you. The devil is waiting for a moment when you're alone, when you're vulnerable, when you're lonely. One of Murphy's Laws of Armed Combat says the enemy only attacks at two times. When you're ready for him and when you're not ready for him. The devil is waiting for an opportune moment. He knows when you least expect it, like 9.45 a.m. on a Sunday morning or Wednesday night at 6 p.m. It's imperative 
that we follow God's advice because the armor and the sword are not enough. Because Ephesians 6, 18 through 20 closes that whole moment with the key that opens the lock to all of this. Paul says, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me that the words may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to boldly proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador and change that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Our daily prayer life is the most important element of our entire salvation. <clears throat> I was talking to Sister Bonnie at prayer meeting one morning <clears throat> a couple of days ago. And I walked over and unplugged the coffee maker and told her, I said, what is this now? Let's make coffee. We can't make coffee. Why? There's no power. It doesn't do anything. I can fill it with water. I can put the grounds in it. I can push the button. I can go make coffee. But it's not going to make coffee because there's no power. Because this was designed to interface with the power in the building and then translate that power into motion. The armor of God is designed to be powered by our prayer. How many of you have seen the Iron Man movie? Okay. I, I kind of dig Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark. Okay. There's a moment when the battery on his suit is dying. Okay. And Jarvis keeps telling him, power at 12%. Power at 10%. Sir, power is critical at 8%. Just put it on the screen and stop telling me. <clears throat> the armor that we wear spiritually is powered by our prayer. If there was a spiritual Jarvis, would he be telling us power at 4%? Power at 2%? Are we powering our spiritual armor? with enough power so that the suit will work the way it's supposed to. It's good for us to pray for yourself. It's, it's, it's good for you to pray for yourself. It's good for us to pray for each other. It's good for you to pray for me. Your, your pastor needs prayer. Paul said, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me. Why? So that we would have boldness to spread the gospel. So all of our armor is so that we can take the gospel on the offensive. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads this evening. Oh, thank you, Jesus. If you're here this evening and you need the forgiveness of Christ, you need to be washed in the blood of Jesus this evening. I talk about the breastplate of righteousness, the breastplate of justification. And you really don't know what it would feel like to wake up tomorrow like you had never sinned before in your life. To be new. The Bible says that salvation in Jesus is being born again. You have a fresh start, a whole brand new start on life. You've never experienced that before, and you want to. You say, Pastor, I need the forgiveness of Jesus. I need to be washed in the blood of Jesus. I want my sins forgiven and washed away right now. I want you to pray for me. Just raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Amen. You're here tonight. Perhaps you... You know the love of God. You know what it is to be religious. You know what it is to walk into a place and say, I'm serving God. But when you leave this place, it's a whole different story. And the struggles of your life are too much to bear. 
so you don't struggle. You live one life outside of church and you live another life in church. <coughs> and you say, it's got to end. It's too stressful. It's too stressful being two different people trying to live one way and have the respect of a certain number of people and then trying to live another way and having an entirely different rules for respect in this place. It's too much. I need to just commit myself to Jesus and I need to just live for Him. Raise your hand. I want to pray for you.
merciful. And the fact that he took the time to equip us to be victorious. You know, he didn't just leave us with an enemy that we can't defeat. And say, don't worry. In the future, he's going to be defeated. Right? We're not blindly hoping for some future victory. Just wait till Armageddon, jerk face. You know? We're going to be victorious now. We're going to be victorious in every area of our life. Temptations? We don't have to deal with that. We're going to fight. You know? The name of this sermon... Which I never said, but the name of the sermon was Get on Your Knees and Fight Like a Man. Because <laughs> that's how we fight. We're going to get on our knees and we're going to fight, man. And we're going to take the battle to the gates.